and celebrations. We want the world to know the happiest can be. Hello, Dr. Ryan here again. And guess what? Um, today is our 40th algorithm in internal medicine together. Woohoo! I'm excited. Thank you for once again joining me. Thank you for those who have been liking and sharing and subscribing to my videos. And I hope you guys are really enjoying the content. I'm really enjoying bringing it to you. And I hope this is beneficial for you as we strive to become better physicians. All right. So today we're talking about our second topic in rheumatology. And this one, I hope, is not in vain. Okay, we're talking about systemic vasculitis. But as always, allow me to please favor you with a joke or two. Um, please humor me on this right so do you know that you can hear the blood in your veins if you listen very closely <laughs> and uh, what did the, the the blood cell say before it died in the artery he said i will not die in vain <laughs> okay this is the last one right a man goes to his doctor for a follow-up on his deep vein thrombus the doctor says, so I prescribed you blood thinners last month. Uh, have you been taking them, sir? The man said, no, doc, and I have a very good reason why not, though. The doctor said, ah, the clot thickens. <laughs> so, yeah, hope you guys are well. Let's get going. Vasculitis describes a heterogeneous group of diseases that share the definitive feature of blood vessel wall inflammation. Now, vasculitis can involve blood vessels of virtually any type, size, and location within the body and can lead to partial or complete luminal compromise with ensuing ischemia of the related tissues. Systemic vasculitis refers to a group of named primary vasculitides that are immune mediated and individually distinguished by the presence of unique clinical pathological features. Now, the clinical manifestations of systemic vasculitis are protein. It may be confined to a single organ or affect a wide range of organ systems. Systemic vasculitis should be considered when a particular physical finding of uh, a constellation of uh, physical findings are present <clears throat> or multiple systems are involved. Systemic vasculitis can involve the large vessels, medium vessels, small vessels, as per our algorithm. Okay, now individual vasculitides predominantly affect either small, or medium, or large, but are capable of affecting vessels of more than one size. So this is not a hard and fast rule, guys. Okay, the primary large vessel uh, systemic vasculitides, we're going to break this down, okay? Um, and uh, yeah, so remember that systemic vasculitis can be associated as well with a wide variety of secondary conditions and we'll be talking about this. So according to the Chapel Hill classification of 2012, systemic vasculitides is divided into large, medium and small. So large vessel largely we're speaking to giant synarthritis, right? Uh, predominantly affects the older folks and also called temporal arthritis, okay? <clears throat> then there's Takayasu arthritis which classically affects the, <clears throat> sorry, Younger females, <clears throat> frog in my throat again, oh dear, right? <clears throat> uh, that's the, the, the younger females and causes what we, we term pulse less disease. And then of course, the whole host of secondary causes for large vessel vasculitides. Medium vessel divided into <clears throat> polyarthritis nodosa, which is called PAN, and it's infamous for causing mononeuritis multiplex. And PAN, interestingly, has a close association with hepatitis B. Kawasaki disease, which happens more often in our kidneys, to the pediatric population, and we'll talk about this further on. Secondary causes as well, bear in mind. So small vessel, there's 10 divided into anchor positive or negative. Anchor stands for anti neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody. Okay, so first up here is GPA, which is called granulomatosis with polyangiitis. Previously, it was called Wegener's, but the nomenclature has changed, all right? Then we have eosinophilic GPA, which is uh, was previously called shirk strauss syndrome and microscopic polyangiitis, okay? So, to a certain extent, these can call hepatopulmonary syndromes, right? And there's a whole host of secondary causes as well. And then small vessel uh, uh, vasculitides associated with a negative anchor include henoxone lime purpura, uh, which can cause IgA nephropathy, okay? Cryoglobulinemia, and we'll speak about this. Boucher's disease, anti-glomerular-based membrane disease. Now, do you remember? where this cousin came from before we saw this guy when we approached the algorithm on hemoptysis and we said this was otherwise called good pasture syndrome which attacks the epithelium in the pulmonary vasculature and the renal vasculature so here we have it again it's coming to revisit us hello 
Right, articular vascularis is the other one, usually hypocomplementemic, small vessel, leukocytoclastic articular vascularis, and a whole host of secondary causes. All right, this is a nice mnemonic to remember for Kawasaki, but it affects mainly the, the, the kidneys. So the diagnostic criteria, you've got to have four out of the following five. Cream is the mnemonic. The C stands for conjunctivitis, which classically is non exudative R speaks to rash, which is polymorphous, non-vesicular. E speaks to edema or erythema of the hands or feet. A is for adenopathy, which is cervical, often unilateral, and mucosal involvement, speaks to erythema or fissures or crusting. This is a, well, sorry, the previous uh, algorithm or the previous diagram, sorry, was courtesy of Dr. Gohari.com. Go check his stuff out. It's really helpful. <clears throat> Another helpful resource is Mr. George Muniz over at the guys at midcoin.com. Henox online purple, as we say, is the most common form of systemic vascularis in kids. And it's characterized by renal disease as to the kidney pointing at you here. Palpable purpura, this is the classic distribution of the um, the vasculitic rash over the buttock area. Arthritis and abdominal pain. And biopsy of affected organs demonstrates IgE deposition. Okay, and this is a beautiful mnemonic. I love it. Causes of secondary vascular disease. Now, remember, these can affect any one of the vessel sizes large, medium, small. There's considerable overlap between them. Let's go. When you're thinking about secondary vascular disease, we think about V standing for various drugs, a whole lot of them purple thiouracil, hydralazine, amiodarone, the list goes on. A is for autoimmune in the way of systemic lupus erythematosus, rheumatoid arthritis, Bechet's uh, syndrome. Collapsing polychondritis and so forth. S stands for serum sickness, all right, uh, often associated with penicillin. Okay, C is for cryoglobulinemia, and we speak about this, the three different kinds. U is for ulcerative colitis, alpha low complement, where we're speaking in the context of hypocomplementemic articular vascularis. I, a whole host of infections, thinking viral infections, HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, EVV and CMV, the infamous cousins, and even rickettsia as well. T speaks to tumors in the way of lymphoma, multiple myeloma. I stands for IgA nephropathy, which also associated with Henoxon and Purpura. S is smoking related thromboangitis or trans. You think secondary vasculitis, you think the mnemonic vasculitis. Beautiful, guys. All right, breaking into some OSCE questions as usual from the Mayo Clinic. Thank you for that. A 47-year-old man has hepatitis C, joint pains, weakness, polyneuropathy, and skin lesions shown here. What is the most likely cause? So we have a whole host of uh, causes of vasculitis here. This is kind of very specific, right? And we're homing in here to mixed cryoglobulinemic vasculitis. Let's spend a few moments and speak about this beautiful entity. Uh, so this is actually type 2, which is mixed cryoglobulinemic vasculitis. Cryoglobulins are immunoglobulins that reversibly precipitate in cold temperatures and are classified by their immunoelectrophoresis and immunofixation patterns into type 1, 2, 3, depending on the monoclonal and polyclonal distributions. Now, more than 70% of patients have one or more of the following, palpable purpura, arthralgia, or arthritis and weakness, and the combination of all three major symptoms is known as Meltzer's triad, uh, M-E-L-T-Z-E-R, triad, and is found in less than 40% of patients. Now, acro oscillations in necrosis may occur where peripheral temperature is less than core temperature. Polyneuropathy occurs in 40 to 70 percent of patients. The vast majority of cases previously known as essential mixed cryo are now thought to be due to hepatitis C. So there's a close association between hep C and cryo and hep B and PEN. Okay. Um, Right, so they say that mixed cryo may be present in more than 50% of hep C infected patients, sorry. However, cryoglobulinemic vasculitis develops in only a minority of these patients, okay. Um, sample collection is critical. Venous blood must be kept at 37 degrees Celsius for two hours before serum is removed and placed at 4 degrees Celsius for up to four days to allow cryoproteins to precipitate. Another fun question for you guys coming up here. A previously healthy 26-year-old man presents with a three-week history of abdominal pain and arthralgia. Oh, dear. On physical examination, hypertension, and palpable purpura of the low extremities. Around. This is usually classic for a particular condition, which we just spoke about, right? Your analysis shows hematuria. What is the most likely diagnosis? Henoch Schonlein purpura. Let's talk about this. Henoch Schonlein purpura is a systemic hypersensitivity vasculitis. Virtually all patients with Henoch Schonlein purpura have palpable purpura. On the clinical signs and symptoms on presentation are abdominal pain, arthritis, and hematuria. Biopsy shows vasculitis with IgA deposits. Contribut levels are normal. Complications of inaction like purpura include hypertension, glomerulonephritis, intersusception, watch out, and GI hemorrhage, okay? Um, I think that is what they're showing us here. See these dilated loops of bowel? There's, they're speaking to large bowel obstruction, which is probably due to intersusception, okay? Um, and Henoxon and purpura usually resolves spontaneously after one week, although it may occur on several occasions over weeks to months because complete, uh, but sorry, before complete remission or after re-exposure to the offending antigen. Treatment is supportive only. Prognosis is usually excellent, especially in kids, but worsens with increasing age.
All right, so there you have it. Two examples in context, guys. I hope you enjoyed that. All right, let's just have a, a quick glance once more at our algorithm. So, you know, as always, just want to encourage you with a scripture. This one taken from the book of Luke, chapter 11, verses 33 to 36. We're speaking about the lamp of the body. Jesus himself says, No one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. Instead, he puts it on its stand so that those who come in may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are good, your whole body is also full of light. But when they are bad, your body is full of darkness. See to it then that the light within you is not darkness. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light and no part is, uh, of it is dark, it will be completely lit as when the light of a lamp shines on you. So here Jesus is making an analogy between the eyes um, and a lamp. Okay, making provision for light. So in the spiritual context, uh, when people's spiritual eyes, that is when their attitudes, motives, and desires are directed towards God's will, then the light of his word enters their hearts to produce blessings, fruit, and salvation. I mean, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. But if their desires are not focused on the things of God, then God's revelation and truth will have no effect. I pray that we will be able to, you know, obey God. Be sensitive to the voice of His Holy Spirit speaking into our lives, and we will embody the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Okay, hope that you guys were edified and uh, encouraged and blessed, and hope this algorithm was helpful. I will see you tomorrow, and tomorrow we're kicking off with a new discipline endochronology. Oh dear. See you guys then. Take care. Bye.